Hi, welcome to Chapter 7. In Chapter 7, we're going to be discussing the capital asset pricing model and arbitrage pricing theory. So let's start with the capital asset pricing model. Now, this is the core concept. Um, we expect riskier investments to provide higher returns and less risky investments because of our natural risk adverse uh, stance as investors. Now, we know beta measures risk. Um, so stocks with higher betas should have higher returns uh, on average than stocks with lower betas. Now, about 50 years ago, finance professors William Sharp and John Lintner developed a model that uses beta to formally link the notions of risk and return. And this was called the capital asset pricing model. Uh, it attempts to uh, quantify the relationship between risk and return for different investments. And it's important because we get a, the output is the expected return on an investment. And that's gonna depend on uh, three things, the risk-free rate, the expected return, the overall market, and the stock's beta. So with these three inputs, we could use this formula to calculate the required rate of return on investment, which is great. So we have a way of, if a stock, pre, you know, if a stock doesn't pay dividends, there's a lot of valuation models that use dividends, to calculate <clears throat> stock price. Now, if you don't have a dividend uh, and you want to calculate a required rate of return, the capital asset pricing model is the next best thing. And for many stocks where dividends aren't significant, the capital asset pricing model is a good model to use to see how risky a stock is by the higher the required rate of return, the riskier the stock is. So, as we know, securities are going to require a rate of return that relates to the systematic risk and beta measures the systematic risk that we discussed last chapter. Now, we want to look at how the stock is performing in relationship to the market. So that's sort of our the market is sort of our baseline. So here's some assumptions you have to make when you're dealing with the capital asset pricing model. <clears throat> One, you have to assume that investors are price takers. All information relevant to a security analysis is free and public available. These are the market assumptions. All securities are publicly owned and traded. No taxes on investment returns. No transaction costs. Lending and borrowing at the same risk-free rate are unlimited. Okay, so <clears throat> these are mark these are assumptions for the market. Don't get them confused with investor assumptions. So on the other side, investor assumptions are investors plan for the same. Um, single period horizon. Investors are efficient users of analytical methods. Investors have homogeneous expectations. Investors are rational um, mean variance optimizers. Okay, so in order for the capital asset pricing model to be as true as possible, these assumptions have to be um, assumed to be true. However, as you can see by reading through this list of assumptions, not all of them are necessarily 100% um, true. There are shades of gray in there. Now, so we have to keep in mind that these two sets of assumptions listed in this slide, um, you know, it's going to pertain to an, you know, investor behavior, and we want to assume that investors are of more alike than not alike. Specifically in you know, how they optimize their portfolios and how their time horizon uh, and the set of information that they're going to use to calculate their risks and returns. Now, as far as the market structure, you know, we're asserting that markets are well functioning, that, you know, there are few impediments to trading and uh, the assumptions, you know, that, um, especially when we're talking about transaction costs and we're talking about uh, taxes, we know that those are not true. There are taxes, there are transaction costs, but in order to calculate, when we usually calculate the asset pricing model, we're ignoring um, that those pieces of input. Now, um, so this helps us to make more empirical tests on this model. And, you know, so the capital asset pricing model uh, we want to summarize the equilibrium. Let's move to the next slide. 
Okay, we want to summarize the equilibrium uh, that's going to prevail in the economy. So there are some, some things that we have to keep in mind. So one, all investors are going to choose to hold a market portfolio, like an S&P 500 index, um, which is going to indicate all assets in, in the investable universe to their, how they define the market. Um, two, a, a market portfolio will be on the efficient frontier. So that the markets will be inherent, the portfolio construct inherently be constructed in the way that the stocks in the portfolio will be on the edges of the efficient frontier. Uh, three, the risk premium of the market portfolio will be proportional to the variances in the market portfolio and investors, the typical degree of risk aversion. Now, so why would all investors hold the market portfolio? Well, we have to assume that investors want to have an optimized portfolio, and we talked about the Markowitz model uh, a chapter or two ago about the efficient, I think it was last chapter, the efficient diversification, uh, and each of the investors, you know, they, these are goals that they want, even though it takes a lot of maintenance and adjusting to make sure you're, you're always on track with a market portfolio that's going to be on the efficient frontier, because every time new information is released, that frontier starts to shift. So this is a, you know, a framework um, basically, the capital asset pricing model is going to ask, you know, what would happen if all investors shared identical uh, investable ideas uh, and they have the same inputs and they draw the same efficient frontiers? You know, so uh, the use of the common input list would obviously be a required assumption, you know, if we're going to try to look at how the model is going to apply to optimizing, you know, an investment common investments over a common horizon. So, you know, in light of these assumptions, investors are, you know, are going to have different um, inputs, different uh, cost levels, but we have to set those assumptions aside, sort of create a, a disbelief in them uh, so that we can make this hypothetical uh, calculations in this, uh, in this equation to make more sense. And it's not, I know it sounds like it would be less reasonable, less accurate, but this is such a complex, so many inputs inv uh, involved in to get an accurate uh, output that you have to slim down and, um, m you know, and pair, pair back some of those inputs uh, and set some to a constant to get a model that you could actually come close to what we're trying to define, which is the risk. So the risk premium on the market portfolio has to be proportional to the variance of the market portfolio and the investor's risk aversion, you know, um, for this e equilibrium this, that we're talking about. So the risk premium on individual assets, uh, proportional risk premium on the market portfolio and proportional to beta coefficient uh, as we can, so we could look at a security on the market portfolio. So it's just ba basically saying that investors are going to want to based on the risk level set in the systematic risk measured by beta, we want to make sure that we're going to get the best return for the risks that we're, we're taking on in total. So this, this, this graphic basically is what's trying to describe where we want to be, you know, on, we look at the CML, which we talked about last class and the effective return, we want to be here, which is going to be the most efficient uh, position. Okay, so let's talk about a passive strategy, you know, uh, and efficiency. So a passive strategy is efficient, um, and if we use the capital asset pricing model uh, and the CML uh, as the optimal, trying to find the optimal CML, the, it's a powerful alternative to an active strategy. So basically we're saying uh, if we get a market portfolio and we're passive as far as not making trades and just sticking to that market portfolio like the S&P 500 index, we're, you know, all investors are going to desire the same risky, the portfolio of risky assets in that index and can be satisfied with just one index fund, an ETF or a mutual fund that's going to comprise that portfolio, say the S&P 500. So the, we definitely know that the passive strategy is more efficient and costs less as far as management fees, as far as transaction costs, and more active strategies. When we say active strategy, we mean the manager who's actively strategizing, buying and selling trading stocks, which creates a lot of costs and taxes when they're buying and selling stocks 
uh, on the capital gains. So that's part of how we could say there are no taxes involved because with a passive strategy, you're going to have much lower level of tax rate. So the last thing they say in the slide is if no one does security analysis, what, what brings about the efficiency of a market portfolio? So basically what we're saying here is you need these security analysts who are buying and selling and active traders because the active traders make the market balance and they're basically they see and hear information they research and analyze information and they buy and sell stock based on the changing risk of you know stock so the supply and demand and the amount of analysts looking at any particular stock and their constant trades back and forth is what makes a balanced uh, stock price a reasonable valuation stock price based on all this trading so if everybody was passive stock prices you know would be less accurate. So we do need uh, security analysts and we need people analyzing and buying and selling stock and not everybody to be passive to have a more efficient um, stock market. So let's look at the risk premium in the market portfolio. So a couple of chapters ago, we talked about uh, individual investors, how you know they decide how much to invest in risky portfolios uh, when they have uh, risk-free assets to choose from as well. So the decision is how much to invest in a market portfolio. And like I said, we're gonna, for most of this lecture, I'm just gonna to refer to a market portfolio as the S&P 500 index. Um, and how much to put in a risk-free asset, like a treasury, treasury bills. Um, so we, we can deduce the, uh, the equilibrium risk premium on the portfolio of the market. Now, you know, the equilibrium risk of the market portfolio um, is going to be, you know, the, the market return minus the risk-free rate uh, to give us a proportional degree of uh, risk aversion that the average investor is going to be, is going to be facing in, in the market portfolio. So when investors purchase stocks, their demand drives up prices, of course, and this is the, the buying and selling supply and demand I was talking about. So lowering the expectations of the rates of returns and the risk premiums uh, was going to result in uh, extra trading on the stock, which is going to bring stock to more of an equilibrium state, which is more f a fully valued or quickly valued state. Uh, but if risk premiums are falling, investors are going to um, are going to you know change some of their funds from riskier market portfolios to maybe the risk free rate. So it depends on what the risk appetite is and how investors are going to move their money between the market return portfolio and the risk-free investment. So it depends on that spread, how big is the difference of uh, the risk premium on the market and how much risk does someone want to assume. You know, um, so when risk premiums fall, investors are going to move funds into the risk-free market. Uh, be, um, and of course, the equilibrium premium of the market portfolio is going to be proportional to one, the risk of the market, and two, the risk adverse of the average investor, which that risk adverse perception can change with the changing times. And that's where if, you know, for example, if things get risky during a market crisis, more the risk aversion of the average investor may change and they may move money out of these market portfolios into a risk-free um, safety of a treasury bill or bonds. Okay, so let's talk about uh, expected returns in individual securities. So if we look at this equation, the expected return for uh, a stock here, this is basically the capital asset pricing model. So what we're trying to do here, I'll just explain this model to you, is, okay, so we, we have the market return here. If we subtract out the risk-free rate, uh, and the reason we want to subtract out the risk-free rate is because we don't want to magnify the market return by beta, uh, the market return fully by beta. So we want to take the market return. Let's take out the risk-free rate. So we're left with the risky part of the return. Multiply that by beta, since beta is a measure of risk, um, the beta coefficient. Once this is amplified by multiplying it by beta, we can add back the risk-free rate. So here the risk-free rate is unaltered. So say the risk rate was 3% and the market return was 10%, we only want to magnify 7% of that market return by beta, add back the risk free rate, and then we get the 
um, requiring beta to return. So this is a relationship between return and beta. So the, um, the security risk premiums, we want that to be proportional to how beta is measuring the risk. We don't want to magnify the uh, risk-free rate. So we could look at the security market line as a graphic uh, chart representation of the, the relationship with, uh, of the return and beta on the capital asset pricing model. So it's a nice way to graphically um, put the risk premiums as a function of uh, asset risk. So the alpha is uh, the abnormal rate of return on securities in excess that's predicted by the equilibrium of the capital asset pricing model. So here is an SML that we can, we can kind of look at. So let's just digest this for a minute. So the expected uh, return beta relationship is going to be sh shown here graphically. And th the mean beta relationship, this is going to be the reward risk equation. So, you know, beta, the beta of a security is going to be the appropriate risk, which we talked about last class, to determine, you know, the, um, the variance of the efficiency of the optimal risk portfolio that we're looking at. So the security market line is going to represent the slope in the risk premium of the market portfolio. So beta, uh, beta one is the beta of the market portfolio. So when we compare a stock to the market portfolio, it's going to be a little bit above or below uh, the market. So it's usually we'll compare on the SML line the, uh, to the capital market line. So the, the CML would be the capital market line, the SML would be the security market line. So this can graph the risk premium uh, of efficient, complete portfolios against individual stocks. Uh, and basically what we're looking to do is a function of portfolio standard deviation. And the standard deviation is a, a valid measure, which we talked about uh, last chapter or two chapters ago, uh, of the risk proportions of any particular stock portfolio, uh, that we, however you know, we want to use it. So the security market line graph that we see here uh, uh, graphs individual risk premiums as a function of market risk. So the relevant measure of risk uh, for an individual asset. So this gives us, so we could see here, here's, here's the market, the beta of one. Here's another, here's two, here are um, a, a stock here with a beta of 1.2. And we can see where that would be on the market line compared to where the stock is in the effective return. So we can compare. Um, it's sort of providing a benchmark for evaluation of the investment performance of the stock and the security mark to the security market line. So it's going to provide a rate of return that's going to compensate for the risk measured by beta. So if we see stocks above that risk, um, there would be riskier than the market. So this is what I say the mean beta relationship and looking for fairly price assets that are, are you know, going to plot, you know, I guess if they plot the, if they plot here on the line, the fairly price, this could be over uh, a deviation from the line. So the actual rate of return on the stock is the alpha. And that's why we see this little alpha here. This is the actual uh, return of the stock. Now the expected return if we look at it as to the expected return, there could be uh, mispricing here. So this is why graphically it's good to look at this. It's interesting. Okay. So let's talk about some applications of the capital asset pricing model. Um, so of course, in the investment management uh, industry, portfolio managers, mutual fund managers, they can use this capital asset model as a benchmark to access expected returns and, uh, or the returns that would be in line to compensate for the risks of the asset. So it's, it's sort of like, like I was saying before, benchmarking. And we can, we can see that, um, you know, in the simple world, the capital asset pricing model with those assumptions we talked about earlier would be much more accurate. But we do live in a world where things are a little bit more complex. But this is, this is a good start, the capital asset pricing model, to really get this relationship um, a position in the relationship that we can understand um, with some constants where the stock lies between the stock risks and the market risks and the overall price of the stock when we're looking at alpha. 
So it's also used good to use in, in capital budgeting decisions. So if we want to look at acquiring a stock, mergers or acquisitions, uh, and we want to use the capital asset pricing model to get a required rate of return that we could use for, say, discounting cash flows or valuing, you know, the capital budget, the internal rate of return, things of that nature, that would be a good start. So think of this is the best start to, to understanding my stocks, individual um, required rate of returns as compared to the market. So it can make, for, if you're doing capital budgeting though, it could be the hurdle rate that you want to surpass. Okay, so the index model is what we're going to talk about now. A relative returns, mean beta equation. So now with an index model here, and you know, keep in mind that a lot of many of these equations in this chapter might be a little confusing, a little big, big, but um, in the uh, for what I want you to take away from this chapter is just the capital asset pricing model formula, uh, not some of these uh, expanded derivatives of it. But we'll talk about it. But I don't expect to see these index models on an exam or anything like that. It's just kind of you know, interesting, just remember that the capital asset pricing model has two limitations. It relies on a theoretical market portfolio, uh, which includes all assets, including, I guess you could say real estate and foreign stocks, and, it apply, and it's applied to um, expected rather than actual returns, because we're trying to make this more looking forward, uh, is how I would say it. Now, the index model was what I was talking about before, the S&P 500 index, we'll use that as sort of um, our all-inclusive portfolio. And the, comp the compensation, composition of the S&P 500, the rate of return of this index is a good model to use because it has 500 stocks, 500 of the larger stocks. So can we use the capital asset pricing model to help predict the these index models so the market portfolio you know is going to be a mean variance efficiency and the index model can be used to test this hypothesis to verify index how the index is designed to represent the full market and, and what its mean variance efficient uh, level is at so now another way to say it, to, to test the mean variance efficiency of an index we have to show that its sharp ratio uh, um, is not suppressed by any other portfolio. And that would really cement that it is the, it's in relationship to the S&P 500 index. Now, so really it's just saying we can use the capital asset pricing model to verify the efficiency of the index model. Uh, and we can also use it to uh, estimate the uh, index model as it is shown here, which would be the residual is going to equal the actual return minus the predicted returns for, say, for Google. Okay. So let's move on to the security characteristics line. Now here we're going to plot a securities expected excess returns over the risk-free rate as a function of the excessive returns in the market. Uh, and remember, the required rate is going to be uh, that capital asset pricing model formula, the risk-free rate plus beta times the expected excess or return for an index, if we want to put this in the index uh, frame. Now, as far as beta and predicting betas, uh, betas are going to move towards the mean over time. So the, if we want to predict the future betas, we have to adjust estimates from historical data uh, to account for the regression towards one. So this is just a fact of how beta migrates over time. Now, we to go back to the assumptions, we, we could say that the capital asset pricing model, if we're looking at it towards the real world, is going to be, uh, we have some assumptions that aren't always valid or, or sometimes are less accurate or correct, depending on what state of the economy or consumer perception is, uh, investor perception is the market. But still, 
a very useful predictor of what the expected returns or the required returns are needed for the risk level of an asset. Now, there has been a lot of studies done to test the effectiveness of the capital asset pricing model with varying degrees of successfulness in, 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 in its tests. Uh, but the overall principle of what this model is trying to do is, is a valid way to look at the market, look at systematic risk, measure diversity, um, and look at how well diversified a risk portfolio can be to a broad range of investors. Uh, and the multi-factor models uh, can be used uh, that's going to hopefully these models of security returns that respond to several systematic factors. So we could say a two index portfolio in realized returns and two factor SML, which again are, are expansions in, of this capital my, uh, asset pricing model formula onto models related to uh, portfolios, specifically portfolios of indexes. Now, there's also the, the um, three factor model, which is gonna uh, estimate results as far as three aspects of successful specification, higher adjusted R square, lower residual standard deviation, and smaller value of alpha. So it's another abbreviation to the model. Now, and here is some of the uh, estimated single index and three factor um, regressions for a forward on their monthly data. And you can see that the residual standard deviation is pretty close. The R squared is higher here. And again, these are statistical measures, sort of picking apart and expanding the formula here. Uh, it's not necessarily what, you don't have to really worry about these formulas. They're, they're these, these bigger formulas. I just want you to worry about the capital asset pricing model formula and what that represents. And the bottom line, the capital asset pricing model represents using beta as a measure of systematic risk in relationship to the market risk to get what the expected return is for an individual asset. Um, what the other models and formulas this chapter talks about is expanding it uh, beyond that theory. And it's not necessarily, if you're new, newly uh, beginner in investments, these are things that you really wouldn't have to uh, encounter unless you were a portfolio manager at a, at a later date. And one thing portfolio managers can do is they have the ability to utilize, especially hedge fund managers have, are more commonly utilizing arbitrage as a way of collecting returns. Now, arbitrage is when you recognize there's a mispricing and you want to profit from it. So here's an example. Say you have a, a textbook or already yet, we'll say a video game. So you have a video game, you you see that the used market for the video game is, is you go to a store and they'll offer you $40 to buy the, this used video game from you. Now, that would make sense if you purchase the game for $60, the used market will purchase it from you for 40, and then they'll re maybe resell it at 45 or 50. And that's how the market for these re resold video games should work. But there could be a mispricing where maybe the, the video game is suddenly on sale. So there's a 40% off the video game. So you're able to purchase it at 30 and sell it to the uh, reseller for 40, making, so making you a $10 profit. So if you see this mispricing because the retailer didn't realize that the game was put on sale and you go and you start buying more copies at $30 and going to these different stores to try to resell them at 40, eventually, they'll catch up and the price will change and you'll miss the, the arbitrage opportunity will disappear. But for a brief while, you can make a $10 profit. And that sometimes happens with mispricing of assets where you can go in, buy them at a lower price and sell them at a higher price instantaneously. And this only occurs for a very short period of time and is quickly remedied by supply and demand in the marketplace. So the risk return relationship from, um, from a standpoint there, it reduces risk to zero if you're able to buy it and sell it at this very similar instance for a profit. Um, so when we talk about this arbitrage pricing theory, um, it's not 
something that an average investor is going to easily discover. If you had a, a, an AI and computer covering all prices, double checking all prices between different various markets in the world, you may discover an arbitrage opportunity, a very slim one, and then take advantage of it. And that's sort of like computerized trading could do that. The, um, so this, this, this act of exploiting the mispricing of you know, two assets or securities is quite profitable, but very hard to uncover and take advantage of for a long time because the supply and demand of the markets are going to correct the markets and this arbitrage opportunity will only exa exist for a short period of time. So you have to, somebody has to observe the, this price difference in the market to create this arbitrage. And we can use certain mathematical theories like the arbitrage pricing theory um, that's going to look at and try to discover these mispricings for, for investment reasons. And in this chapter, we, we of course, discuss the calculating of the, of the arbitrage pricing theory, the formulas right here, as well as the returns of well-diversified portfolio. And you know that if you see this, this is the capital asset pricing model again here, and the risk arbitrage model is going to mod be modified from that model. Uh, so what we're looking for is, you know, to apply these calculations to see if that is how the computer model is going to apply these formulas until they find an arbitrage opportunity. So in a well-diversified portfolio, you would want to see all the stocks pretty close to that um, security line. And a, um, as far as the single stocks, there can be all over the price. So there could be opportunities for mispricing. And then, you know, we could use this multi-factor generalization in the asset pricing theory and the capital asset pricing model together to make, you know, help make a factor portfolio. So, you know, basically constructing a portfolio um, to have a beta of zero um, and, and the beta of zero on any other factor. So using this two-factor model for the arbitrage pricing theory, which is described down here. Now, and these are uh, some of the results or outputs. Now, again... This chapter has a lot of mathematical um, examples in it and, and inputs of formulas. Well, actually, it has a lot of formulas, very few examples. Uh, these, this chapter is important for really introducing the concept of the capital asset pricing model and how it's utilized to measure risk and, and required return, which is critical for investment analysis, but also introducing the uh, investment tactic of arbitrage pricing. Now, you as an individual investor, you can utilize the capital asset pricing model, and that could give you some advantages, but the arbitrage uh, portfolio, uh, creating an arbitrage portfolio and opportunities in arbitrage pricing is going to be out of scope for most individual investors. It's only the really highly funded um, investment companies and hedge firms with the proper mathematical equations and computerization can really uh, exploit those models and uh, to make a... Um, a decent return. Okay, so uh, that's it for this chapter. This um, is a very small chapter in relationship to the rest of the book. Uh, so, but I do ask that you read the chapter, think about it, but don't get too upset if some of the theories are a little far out there or just don't make sense in the common world because the assumptions are quite strict in order for these models to work. Uh, and that's why they're not as effective in reality, but they're a good basis to think about these theories and how these concepts can be applied to the marketplace. Okay, thank you for your time and I'll see you in the next chapter.